Next Generation's Erica Figueredo is a Purse Strings approved professional who educates individuals and their trusted financial professionals about the many options and benefits of self-direction, a strategy that allows individuals to use their retirement accounts to invest in alternative assets. Next Generation is the service provider that administers the accounts and holds custody of the assets held within its clients' accounts, providing all record keeping, necessary tax reporting, and transaction support. Next Generation's white glove personalized customer service ensures its clients receive the best possible experience along with the tools and support necessary to control their financial futures today. Thank you, fearless listeners, and go you for hitting play. Please like and subscribe as it helps us grow. Also, share this with a friend as we have to keep talking about this shit. Now let's dive in. Coming up on today's edition of Women and Money, the shit we don't talk about, our guest is Kelly Winjet, founder of Alternative Wealth Partners. Kelly is one of our Purse Strings approved professionals, and she is from Dallas, Texas. And we're so pleased to have Kelly with us today. She's super smart and can teach us a thing or two or three or four about private equity, what it is and how it works. So true. When we met Kelly, we knew she had so much to offer, and we can't wait to dig into her world, her work, and how she got started. Let's jump in. Gloria Steinem once said, we will never solve the feminization of power until we solve the masculinity of wealth. Barbara Provost and Maggie Nielsen are the team at Purse Strings that will help you navigate the ins and outs of financial independence so that you can be financially fearless. This is Women in Money, the shit we don't talk about. Hey, Kelly, we're so glad you're here. Jump in and introduce yourself a bit. Hi, everybody. My name is Kelly Ann Winget. I'm the founder and fund manager of Alternative Wealth Partners. Like they said before, it's a Dallas-based private equity company, and we basically specialize in everything alternatives. Um, I've been in this industry for over a decade. I founded my firm in the middle of the pandemic, which is the perfect time to start a business, um, because I saw a need from investors who were looking for options off Wall Street. So everything I do is in the private space. I don't do anything in the public markets. So that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Well, let's dig in because we got a ton of questions for you. Let's go. Yeah. Um, Kelly, so you're a solo founded, openly gay female private equity firm in the US, maybe the world. Mm -hmm. So give us some background on how you got started with this company, especially during the pandemic. I didn't even know that. <laughs> so um, I am fortunate enough to like, gr I grew up in a financially savvy household. Both my parents were financial professionals, CPAs, accountants. So, uh, you know, we were talking about taxes at the dinner table from the beginning of time. Um, I started actually my career at 15 in sales. I was selling car washes part-time in high school and I was really good at it, but I was making a little over $60,000 a year part-time. Wow. wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So, selling car washes. Selling car washes. Um, and needless to say, I had to start doing my own taxes at 16. So I kind of got my taste for money really early in life. And I kind of just progressed through uh, the years following. I got really bored with the different types of work that I was doing. So eventually I ended up getting really good at Excel and building out databases and uh, tools to use for cost estimating in the uh, construction industry, actually. So I took that experience and was hired by an oil and gas company in uh, 2013 uh, when oil prices were going to $130 a barrel. Now, I'm from Texas, so I was going to end up in oil and gas at some point in my life. Um, I'm five generations in oil and gas, so it's in my family. Uh, I come from a family of engineers and oil and gas investors. So uh, when I ended up in oil and gas in 2013, I saw a lot of red flags, this company I was working with, uh, when oil prices got to be that high. So I started talking to them about, you know, maybe we should change our strategy up a little bit. We're overpaying for these assets. When you're in a male dominated space and you're a 20 year old girl telling old men that they're wrong, um, it doesn't end well. So I wish them the best of luck. I took an opportunity in California and about six months later, oil prices crashed to below $40 a barrel. 
So that's how I got my first taste of private equity was oil and gas. That's love- amazing. <laughs> I would love to see you standing there and telling these telling these <laughs> men of what they should change. I'm sure they were uh, all ears. Yeah, they hired me to make uh, basically baseball cards for their employees. They wanted me to build out a uh, living document that tracked their um, success and then make it appear like a baseball card. So that's what they were doing with their time, looking at made up baseball cards. Wow, Kelly. And I can just imagine you, it just seems like you were just in your sweet spot. I mean, it just seems like you had all this integrated background and life experience being in the family that you were in and brilliance, of course, and speaking your mind or your voice or your opinion. And um, I wish I could have been in that room. (laughs) I'm I'm fortunate enough to have a very opinionated mother. So I think that it uh, passed down. (laughs) That's awesome. I love that. Um, So so tell me again about how you've transitioned into actual private equity and opening your own firm. So when I moved to California, I took an opportunity with a company that was helping private companies raise capital. So I was going into these privately owned businesses, whether they were you know, invented a medical device or they are starting a cannabis company or a tech startup. And I was working with their investor relations teams to talk to investors. Because I came from an affluent background, I was a high income earner myself. I knew how to talk to those types of investors. Individual retail investors are very different than uh, institutional investors. And a lot of people don't have experience working with the individual investor when it comes to private equity. They're very detached. So that was kind of my forefront of working with companies raising capital. About four or five years into that, I moved back to Texas to work on the investor side of things. So helping investors do the due diligence part of how to find the alternative assets uh, available to them outside of the stock market. Eventually, all of that led to a family office, and I worked for a family office, which then led me to a much larger family office and private equity firm who was managing about $3 billion dollars. They were completely detached from reality as far as like what an individual investor is looking for and what they can do on an institutional level. And I was brought in to talk about oil and gas. They had a third of their portfolio in oil and gas and no oil and gas professionals on their team. So (laughs) that's like a billion dollars, right? Yeah. So um, they had raised all this money on oil and gas. They invested in one oil and gas sponsor. They brought me in to start talking to investors about the risk and rewards of oil and gas, even though these investors were already invested in oil and gas. And, uh, you know, my reality is is that oil and gas is a very risky place to invest, and it should be for a very particular group of investors who have strong stomachs because it is really a win all or lose all type situation. This was right at the start of the pandemic. Um, you know, our messaging was agree to disagree on the risk and rewards of oil and gas. And that's when I realized, you know what, I don't like being the smartest person in the room. And if I'm going to be the smartest person in the room, I'm going to be the one managing the money. So that was my aha moment to start my own firm. I love that. I love that so much. I mean, it just got very clear for you, right? Why am I not doing this on my own? So you left that company and just started your own? Yes. And how do you find your investors? So uh, I've created quite the network over the last 12 years. And, um, you know, even though I've, I've worked with some, you know, bad companies and bad actors, it's always been my motivation to make sure that there was a separation between what, you know, I thought was right and wrong and what they thought was right and wrong. So I've maintained my reputation over the last, you know, over a decade. So when I went on my own, there was a lot of people there to support me when I decided to make that decision. But we get investors from all over the place. We actually just got our first TikTok investor, which was kind of cool because um, you you do TikToks and stuff kind of for fun. Um, it's a good way to hit a lot of people, especially when I'm talking about something that's uh, typically gay kept from everyone. Um, mm-hmm. No one openly talks about private equity with people that can't afford to participate. But Um, I think everyone should at least educate themselves about the opportunity because it's in my opinion that you might not be my client today, but you could be my client tomorrow. And so I'm going to talk to you the same either way. And uh, so we we got our first TikTok uh, client. So that was really cool. Do you mean someone from TikTok reached out to you and said they want to invest? Yeah. What is the typical profile (laughs) that you look for for one of these investors? So most of our investors are um, business owners. They make somewhere between a million 
or I guess somewhere around half a million to a million dollars a year in revenue if they're a small independent person. Um, some of our smaller business owners that uh, own more blue collar like HVAC companies or construction companies have a net worth between five and $10 million. But usually it's going to be your executive level. I have a lot of women and a lot of minorities. So I've tried to really target a different group of investors because I've worked with older white men my entire career, and they're not the only ones with money. Um, They're just the only ones that are being talked to about money. There's so many things I love here. I mean, the fact that you're like, I'm the smartest person in the room. Goodbye, everyone. I'm going to be in charge of the money. These people ask you to invest their hundreds of thousands of dollars, which has to feel empowering that you know exactly what's going on Mm -hmm. and that you're bringing in these other communities that are not normally taught this information. And some of that is through, you know, generational wealth. Some of that is through our society, you know, Mm -hmm. saying that only men are good with money, men should manage the money, you know, all these different things. And you're just like, break the bias, break the bias, break the bias down the line. Well, the whole point is like, if from the beginning of my career, and I wrote a book about this, that, uh, you know, sneak preview, it's coming out in April. Um, no big deal. Or, just yeah, no big deal. <laughs> um, the, the phrase, and I'm sure, you know, your audience, if, the, if you've got uh, brokers and advisors in your audience, like, you know, the term don't pitch the bitch from the boiler room. Like it's a real thing that's been said to me in real life. And it's no, pushed. somebody <laughs> said that to you. Yes. And it was encouraged in the sales rooms, like just don't, you know, oh, hang up the phone, the wife answered, um, or they sound foreign, or, you know, there's there's a lot of really terrible things that have been said in these rooms. And that was something that never really made any sense to me because I would go through this huge process of trying to onboard an investor. And it got down to the time where they had to fill out the paperwork and sign the check, right? And in that moment, they're like, I don't know where my checkbook is. I don't know what account I need to use. And then they bring their wife into the conversation. Hmm. And the wife is, of course, upset, right? Because she hasn't been involved in the conversation at all. And she's the one who knows where the checkbook is, knows what bank account the investments come out of. They're budgeting for the entire house. And the reality is, is that the women of the household are making their own decisions. And even today, like women in general, just independently have way more control of their financial situation than men do. And so I just made that shift when I, you know, later in my career, it wasn't always on my own, but, you know, it's a huge focus for us to make sure that even if I'm dealing with the man head of household, that I'm involving both people in the conversation and the clients that we have, you know, because the the clients are, it's a two way street. Like you don't have to accept everybody and everybody doesn't have to accept you. And our clients are, you know, very, the couples that we have are very open with each other about how they invest. And and sometimes they invest independently in the same deal or they invest together. And a lot of the times it's the women's accounts that are larger investments. So Mm -hmm. the husband might come in with a hundred thousand and their wife comes in with two. So that's what we've been experiencing in the last year. That's amazing. I mean, just you talking about your experiences and what we've traditionally seen is a white male arena. And then just you coming in with all your brilliance and telling people what up. I mean, I just think it's really <laughs> great. I love yeah. it. So how how can women invest in this way? Like, do you, I know you look for minorities, you look specifically for women or uh, to invest as well. I really want everybody to be investing in the alternative space, at least a little bit, because in general, it's a gate kept uh, asset class, um, private equity and, uh, specifically. There's a lot more women um, getting into the venture capital space, which is really, really great, Um, except for like, that's the really risky version of private equity, right? Mm -hmm. You're dealing with startups or companies that may or may not make it. You're investing in a hundred different companies, hoping that one really takes off. And in private equity, you're dealing with a little bit more mature companies. You have more control of, you know, maybe the outcome of that based on your experience um, and your expertise. Uh, we provide a lot more than just capital when we invest in these companies. We're providing um, advice. We have experts that get to come in. We get to, you know, partner one company with another company if it makes sense based on their industry. So there's there's a lot of upside there, and the ability to invest in, you know, what I call small business America. Like you're investing in what holds up the majority of the economy, mm-hmm. not venture capital, right? And venture capital should be a very small part of your portfolio, whereas the other alternatives, the tangible alternatives of private equity can maybe make up 10 to 25% of your portfolio. Yeah. 
And so those who are like are not as familiar with private equity, I know you brought up some of the categories that you kind of work with. Um, I know you said like cannabis and gas and some other things. Can you name some of those private equity types that people might be investing in? So um, when we talk about alternatives, it's everything off of Wall Street. So your stocks, bonds and, and cash are your traditional asset classes. Everything else is alternatives. Private equity is its own category. And underneath private equity, you have venture capital hedge funds, right? Outside of that, you have your precious metals. You can invest in commodities. So your oil and gas, your you know corn, those types of things. These are all different private equity opportunities that you can invest in. The private equity that we are involved in is literally investing inside of the companies, the small businesses, the privately owned businesses. I really like the manufacturing and infrastructure space and the energy space, whether that's oil and gas or renewables. Awesome. So, interesting. Yeah, yeah I think so it's so new to so many women that this is even an option out there. Um, so I do love the idea of just, you know, like you said, if you're not a client today, you could be a client tomorrow. I think that um, what people need to realize is that banks used to do this, right? You used to be able to go into your community bank and get a business loan and build a business. Today, businesses can't do that. It's very difficult for a business to go to a bank and get a business loan in order to grow their business. So they're resorting to private investors. Now, most of the time, it's a large private equity company that comes in and buys 51% of your company and takes over and destroys it. But the reality is, is that an individual investor who qualifies, so an accredited investor, anybody with a million dollar net worth or making over 200 grand a year can be the bank to these businesses. So if you understand an industry really well, you can invest in that industry directly just by, you know, maybe finding a business in your community that might benefit from a $100,000 loan or even a, a $100,000 equity uh, position. So you can structure those things on your own. It's complicated. You should probably let a professional do it. But the, the, the point is, is that you have the freedom to do that with your money and you don't need, you don't need anyone to tell you you can't. Got it. So let's say somebody did want to invest a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars into a company. They come to you, Kelly, and um, what do they expect in terms of the return on that money? In terms of ROI and or how long do they invest that for? Do they anticipate to invest that for? So in traditional private equity, you should expect your money to be illiquid, unavailable, tied up, whatever you want to call it, uh, for somewhere between five and ten years. These mm -hmm. are typically long term plays. Now. Got it. The funds that I manage because I have spent a long time working with these projects. And when I decided to do a fund, I had kind of done a lot of the legwork before I even offered it to investors. You know, we did a short term fund is five years. We're targeting 15 to 20 percent uh, annual dividends and with a three to five X uh, at the end of it as far as our equity exits. Wow. So I yeah, I pair cash flowing asset opportunities with uh, long term equity positions. So while we sit around and wait for an exit to happen, we're still generating cash flow from different assets. And that's never existed before, which is why basically the mutual fund of private equity. Mm -hmm. um, so you're getting a little bit of the debt piece with the equity piece. Uh, so you can see how all the different assets produce so that when you go out on your own, you can say like, hey, this, this is a normal return or this isn't a normal return. Mm -hmm. So how big is your company? I know I've seen on some of your TikToks, you had other employees that work with you. So um, we've launched a second fund. We're getting ready to launch a third fund. Our first fund is around $17.5 million. Our energy fund is close to $2 million. Uh, we have an acquisitions company, which is a completely separate uh, thing. It's not necessarily structured like a fund. And that one is going to be a $22 million project. The third fund that we're launching uh, that will co-GP with Syzygy Cities out of New York is a billion-dollar infrastructure fund. Wow. Good for you. Thank you. <laughs> That's crazy. So how do people find out about you and where you are and how to work with you? TikTok. Um, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> it's one source. It worked, right? Yes. Um, so I'm Kellyanne Winget on all things online. I personally manage my LinkedIn. So if you find me on LinkedIn um, and message me, it's me who answers. Other than that, there's a couple of people that run my other social medias, my Instagram, my TikTok and uh, Facebook. But you can visit alternativewealthpartners.com to find out about uh, the private equity things we're doing. And if you want to know more about what I'm doing on the book and speaking events and that type of stuff, you can go to kellyannewinget.com. Are you going to share the book name with us? 
<laughs> it's called Pitch the Bitch and it's Grab Your Financial Futures by the Bag. I love it. I love it. I love That's it. awesome. Yeah, we can't wait for that to come out and promote that for you. You can so. sign up. You can sign up uh, for the release on kellyannwinter.com. Uh, we'll have the information there under the book. The book. The book. And it this really goes into detail about like all the stuff that was experienced in this space. I'm sure it's <laughs> it was unreal. And, you know, I didn't spend too much, you know, too much time in the, you know, in the cubicles or in a financial services sector. So I have not heard the term pitch the bitch before, um, but lines up with every story I've been told. Yeah. If you've never seen The Boiler Room, go back and watch that mm -hmm. that wonderful movie. <laughs> Got it. So do you have any other parting thoughts for our listeners today? I could have saved myself a lot of time if I had the confidence I have today, like 10 years ago. And so your listeners that are either looking for options or like starting their financial journey, they just need to have confidence that they know what they're doing. Like you probably know more than somebody else. And just to be confident in your own education, you know, what, what you're studying, what you're committing yourself to learn um, is enough. I love that. And a lot of times with women, you know, we always think we need to know it a hundred percent all the way before we get started. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that's not true. It's yeah. just getting started. That's the hardest right. part. Right. The thing about investing is that it's just an idea and a strategy is completely independent of somebody else's. So you really have to take everything you learn when it comes to investing with a grain of salt, because at the end of the day, it's your money and you're going to spend it however you want. I love it. Yeah, it's your money, right? So don't just be handing it over to people who say, don't worry about it, honey, I got you. I got yeah. this. You really yeah. need to understand and learn about what's happening with your money. Right, right. And I, I think, so uh, Maggie, we met at the Women Working in Wealth Summit last yep. year. And um, I'm actually going to be on a panel this year there. Oh, awesome. And we're going to be talking about all of the crazy stuff when it comes to alternatives. I can't wait to yeah. just to tune in. It should be very interesting. This is a whole new space for me. And um, it's just so interesting to hear all the options are out, that are out there because sometimes I think, yeah, it's not shared. It seems limited. I mean, there's thousands of options, so it's not that limited, but there are so many things, you know, which you don't know, you don't know. Now I'm learning. Right. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you so much. As we've said before, Kelly is one of our Purse Strings approved professionals. You can also found, find her on our Purse Strings site. We love having Kelly bringing this expertise to the table. It really broadens what's out there in terms of investing, um, investing for women and other opportunities that you know, we have experts that can answer your questions on this if you want to diversify in this way. So thank you so much, Kelly. We love having you on our podcast and sharing this great, important information. And anyone who wants to reach out to Kelly, there are several ways to connect with her. We'll have it all in the show notes as well. So thanks, Kelly. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, let's be financially fearless. Information is for illustrative purposes only and does not constitute tax, investment, or legal advice. Always consult with a qualified investment, legal, or tax professional before taking any action. Next Generation's Erica Figueredo is a purse strings approved professional who educates individuals and their trusted financial professionals about the many options and benefits of self-direction, a strategy that allows individuals to use their retirement accounts to invest in alternative assets. Next Generation is the service provider that administers the accounts and holds custody of the assets held within its clients' accounts, providing all records keeping, necessary tax reporting, and transaction support. Next Generation's white glove personalized customer service ensures its clients receive the best possible experience along with the tools and support necessary to control their financial futures today.